in this second course on models of livestock, of diseases in livestock, uh, what I'm going to uh, introduce are a few models of avian influenza. So the previous course we saw foot and mouth disease, uh, we're switching to uh, avian influenza here. So um, what I want to do, oops, is uh, go over a um, brief recap of the characteristics of avian influenza and then present a few models. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to do is, uh, like I did for foot and mouth disease, uh, first give you a sort of recap of what we already said about uh, avian influenza and then a little bit about the history of outbreaks mechanisms of spread and something about uh, where the virus is located. Um, so uh, the first thing is, well, we saw that already, uh, avian influenza is caused by an influenza virus, an influenza A virus more specifically. Uh, it's adapted to birds, but it can also uh, stably adapt and sustain person-to-person -person transmission. Uh, which is one of the reasons why it is considered a major public health risk uh, virus. Uh, and uh, this we saw already in the previous uh, lecture, I mean in the introductory lecture on uh, um, uh, zoonosis and etc. Uh, HV, one of the main reasons uh, why avian influenza is feared is that there is a high pathogenicity version of the virus, uh, so uh, which is called the HPAI. Um, it's typically H5N1, but there can be others. Uh, and this is really thought to uh, be something that can cause risks uh, to uh, global uh, public health risks. Um, one uh, thing that is interesting is before the COVID pandemic, where the, the main focus was on H5N1, um, obviously the COVID pandemic showed that uh, it is not only avian influenza viruses that are potentially uh, uh, disruptive, uh, but this remains very much a, a topic of concern, in particular because the case fatality ratio uh, for some of the strains of avian influenza, of high path avian influenza, is very high. Uh, and it's altogether, anyway, a global concern because it involves multiple bird species, both wild and livestock. Um, and we'll come back to many aspects on the spatial, when the, the lecture on spatial aspect. But before that, a uh, little uh, review. So we saw that already. This is a paper by uh, Lupiani and Reddy uh, that reviews the history of avian influenza. It's a little uh, dated now, so of course there are uh, new things to add to this, but in terms of the older um, uh, events, uh, this paper is really nice. And so they go through a list of events linked to this. So you can see that the first uh, event or description, let's say, of a high path uh, avian influenza virus is from uh, quite a while ago. Um, and then in 1880, people were able to distinguish uh, HPAI from foul uh, cholera. Uh, in uh, the early 1900s, HPAI was identified as a virus. Uh, there were a bunch of major epidemics uh, throughout the world. The f well, there's a major human pandemic like the, uh, the uh, uh, Spanish, so-called Spanish flu uh, in 1918. Uh, and you can see the history here. Uh, and of course, our understanding of the virus uh, progressed, so uh, we're also able to much better characterize what virus is uh, going on at a given instant in time. And this is what is shown in this table. Um, 
bizarre outbreak search of HPAI, uh, so high path uh, avian influenza uh, since 1959. So interesting. Well, I mean, uh, you can see the dates here. These are the dates at which the strain is identified. It's not necessarily exactly the same date as the time when the outbreak took place, but it's relatively uh, closely related. So that, that last digit, uh, that, well, the last two digits here, um, I'll tell you the date. Okay, so 85, 91, 92, 94, etc. And uh, <coughs> you can see that several different species are affected, several different subtypes of the virus are affected. And uh, remember that I started by talking about H5N1, but you can see that there are some H7s in here as well. Uh, so it's not limited to H5N1. H5N1 was the one that most people feared uh, prior to, let's say, in the uh, from early 2000s until 2019, essentially, when COVID took place. Uh, but there were other strains uh, that um, were um, caused problems, uh, not necessarily in humans. Okay. Uh, but so, and you can see that it affected a variety of animals, and these are uh, the number of uh, animals that were culled uh, as a preventative measure uh, to uh, contain these outbreaks. And so, you can see that it ranges from a uh, very small impact to 17 million uh, animals or millions of animals etc. Um, and this the list continues. Uh, you can see so and it affects chicken, wild bird, etc. But here for example you can see uh, there were 14 million uh, chickens killed because of an outbreak in Turkey and Italy. Uh, but they also killed ostriches uh, that must have been raised for food and etc. And you can see, by the way, here, ostrich uh, in South Africa, uh, which there is raised for food. Uh, so there's a variety of outbreaks like this that took place. Uh, now, and I showed that graph uh, in the introductory uh, lecture on uh, diseases, uh, well, uh, livestock diseases. Uh, these are the times when there were uh, human cases. So this is not the object of this course, but I thought I would show this slide again. Uh, these are, and you can see a variety of different strains. Again, some H5N1, but also H9N2, etc. Uh, with the most recent ones all being H5N1s. Uh, and hence the fear about H5N1, but that's not the only one. Uh, and these are human cases, the number of cases, the number of deaths uh, between parentheses, uh, the type of symptoms that were uh, displayed by the people that got affected, and the source of the infection, uh, which typically was contact with poultry, but some cases were unknown, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the mechanism of spread now, uh, influenza is a respiratory virus. I don't have to go uh, into a lot of detail, but I'll just point out this uh, very interesting paper, uh, again, about the natural history of high path H5N1. Uh, again, you see this is pre-COVID pandemic, I'm guessing now. Uh, the focus might change a little bit, but I mean, still remains a problem. Uh, what's interesting here, and we'll come back to that essentially in the second and the next lecture about spatial aspects. But this is showing you the type of interactions that happen. Uh, you see, so this is essentially the um, livestock component. Okay, there's uh, sustained interspecies uh, transmission. Uh, there's sporadic transmission into other wild bird species. 
um, uh, I should say livestock is here, these are uh, wild birds. So between the wild birds and, uh, oops, uh, <laughs> it's difficult to uh, aim, uh, between the wild birds and the livestock, there is uh, transmission. Sometimes there is uh, sustained or uh, sporadic transmission within the livestock birds. There is sustained interspecies transmission within uh, wild birds and the two can interact. There's also some bird species that are not affected quite as often, but might get it. Uh, and there's also uh, the transmission to humans and that's the sort of the one health point of view where everything is linked. Uh, this is what you see here. Uh, and again, we'll come back to that uh, when we're looking at spatial aspects. And this is a very interesting characterization of the type of transmission activity that is taking place. So there's a stable period, uh, and you can see that there's low path, uh, LPAI is low path avian influenza, uh, that would be transmitted, for instance, to domestic poultry, it can be transmitted to mammals, then, uh, it can go from this sort of stable period into a transition period with a sporadic uh, transmissions that are still LPI, but there could be mutations uh, from low path into high path um, avian influenza. And then when things go bad, then essentially we go from this low pathogenicity uh, transmission into uh, a high path uh, transmission pattern, uh, which then expands. And this is uh, the timeline of the transmissions of the uh, Guangdong, uh, so that's close to Hong Kong, uh, but in mainline China, uh, Goose Guangdong lineage of H5N1, and this is how it sort of spread to the various uh, country, well, regions in the world. And again, we'll come back to that in the following lecture. One interesting question uh, that I haven't addressed so far and I'll address here is uh, where does one find the virus? Because you will see that the first few models that I'll be looking at uh, are within host type models. And here, uh, when you're looking at the, this is really where the transmissions originally take place. So where is the virus present uh, for it to then spread to other uh, locations? So uh, this is uh, also an interesting paper, uh, again, a little old, uh, but uh, it's about, so where do you find viruses in poultry products? So this is a very exhaustive list of uh, places where you can find the product. So you can see what they're looking at is, for instance, meat, eggs, feathers, liver and blood and skin. And then they look at the different species. They uh, list the different strains and whether the, uh, the, exper the experiment that characterized this presence was experimental or if it was something that was observed because of an outbreak. Um, what is the infecting dose uh, in, uh, of the virus and how much virus they detected, uh, the titers, in the whatever commodity they are looking at. So for example, chicken meat, uh, this was how much uh, virus is detected in that um, commodity. And you can see that so the virus has been uh, detected in a variety of uh, commodities of different types of uh, meat or uh, animal products. Um, This is, uh, yes, this is uh, the same type of idea here, uh, but it's showing you uh, in terms, again, of the commodity, uh, same, same uh, type of data. <clears throat> and now let me switch to 
the modeling part itself. Okay, so uh, one of the things is again, as I've said with foot and mouth disease uh, before, what's quite interesting in this context is that there are uh, a lot of data um, that the experimental context is easier to, uh, to conduct than in humans. Um, and so there's, there's quite interesting data and um, Actually, I have more models than this. Uh, I forgot to put titles. I will add that to the slides. Um, so let me go over uh, modeling. So uh, one thing is that if you uh, search Google Scholar or another um, paper indexing uh, system, uh, you will see that there is a lot more literature uh, concerning avian influenza than there is for foot and mouth disease. Uh, there's, uh, I mean, in terms of mathematical models. However, I will point out that a bit the same way as with foot and mouth disease, there is a very strong focus on several aspects. And in terms of avian influenza, so for foot and mouth disease, I pointed out that a lot of the models deal with farms. Uh, for avian influenza, most models consider zoonotic aspects. That means they are looking at transmissions to humans in particular. So they look at transmissions within birds, I mean, uh, within a bird uh, community, but they're really interested in the transmission from these bird communities into the humans. Uh, so I'm going to skip this for now, okay? Uh, I might talk about it uh, a little bit more uh, in the spatial uh, part of the lecture, uh, with the next lecture. But for now, I'll skip this and I'll focus on models that really look at livestock. So poultry, essentially. Uh, the first model I, uh, I want to go over uh, very quickly is a model by Stigerman, uh, Buma, and De Jong. And it's uh, two models, I mean, this one and the next are models for the within host. Oh, sorry, no, before I, this is a review, sorry. This is a review uh, by Stigerman and uh, Buma and De Jong. Uh, so they here have collected um, a bunch of reasons why you would look at analytical models or simulation models. Uh, they list advantages and disadvantages of both types of models. This uh, the reason I'm including this, uh, if you remember in the foot and mouth disease uh, part, I was my conclusion had to do about uh, knowing how to communicate with health uh, people, for instance, in terms of what your models can and cannot do. And so I really like uh, this type of uh, point of view where uh, they've taken some time to, uh, to sort of put forward uh, what are the advantages of different uh, modeling uh, contexts, so whether it's analytical or simulation, and what are the disadvantages? Because I think this is something that is very uh, good to bear in mind when you're having discussions um, as mathematicians, I say this, and not for the public health people in here, but for the uh, mathematicians, this is something to keep in mind. Uh, one thing that uh, they have done here, which I found uh, quite interesting from a modeling point of view, is that they have uh, high path and low path uh, strains, and they have uh, here uh, some values for the, uh, uh, the basic reproduction number. Okay, so this is something if you're looking for data, uh, if you're looking to parameterize a model, uh, these are uh, very interesting. Um, data to have, and I'll point out that some of the data is coming from experimental uh, uh, settings and some are from field work. 
and you can see by the way that as is common uh, in any disease the estimates of r0 vary quite wildly uh, so you can see uh, typically it's around let's say 1.3 1.5 but there are some cases where they find very high values of r0 it can depend to a large extent on the methodology used to compute R0, uh, but that is something to bear in mind. And again, uh, they have transmission uh, for low path and high path and values of R0 here. Uh, these, these are field studies only. Uh, <coughs> so, the first model, a uh, proper model, so you can look at the review in Stegemann and they go over, uh, they, well, they list models, they don't really uh, detail them. The first model that I want to look at is a model by Xie and others, a group from Guelph. Um, and it's a relatively recent model, well, quite recent model. It uh, appeared in 2020. And this one and the next are um, models that are within Hoxton. I thought that was an interesting uh, thing to bring up. I'm not going to go into details very much because this is not really what I do. I don't really work on the immunological side, but I'll point it out because I think it's interesting. Uh, so this is a within host model of H9N2. Um, and what they look at, and I, I think that model is particularly interesting, this, this first paper, uh, what they look at is a, a sort of a class of models. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a second. So what they, uh, they consider a variety of mechanisms, and you can see these are interferon uh, pathways, and they, they say, okay, maybe it can interact here, it can play a role here, it can play a role here. Um, so they are looking at a, a collection of models. This is why I, I wanted to talk about this particular work. Uh, what they do is they look at model types. So this is something I'm not going to describe in, in detail at all here, but this is an interesting approach which considers data and uh, and a collection of models and then looks at how, how, what model with different arrows activated. So the idea is essentially you turn on this arrow, you turn it off, you turn on this arrow, you turn it off, you turn on this arrow, you turn it off, and etc. The different mechanisms here are activated or inactivated. But models are, each type of model that results from this, they are fitted to uh, whatever data is available. And the error, okay, so this is the SSC, the sum of squared errors. The error is computed, but also uh, what is called the Akaike information criterion, uh, which is a measure of the complexity of the model. So a model that has uh, less parameters, for example, so less arrows, might not fit quite as well as another model, but because it has less parameters, it is better in view of that criteria. Okay. And so in terms of, uh, so what you can see here is that they obtain a ranking of the models that they are looking at uh, in terms of their IKK, the, the lower, the better. Okay, so the better model is this one. And so <clears throat> this, uh, I, I mentioned this in passing because it is a method that uh, is not used a lot, but could be worth trying in some of your uh, work if, if you're doing this. Uh, the next model I want to look at, and I'll, same, I'll go very, very briefly, is another within host model. This one is by Hagenars and others, and they're looking at the innate immune response uh, of uh, the chicken against avian influenza. Okay. And here I will just show 
again, as I said, this is not really my uh, my field, uh, but uh, what the type of model that they consider uh, is again an immunological model. Here, it's looking at how the virus behaves in uh, in a given chicken, uh, and what type of immune response you get. Um, and so that's what the model does. And it's an interesting model, likewise, uh, like the previous one. It doesn't do this uh, model, um, model collection approach, but it is uh, very interesting also. Uh, the next uh, model that I want to go over, and uh, as you can see, this is a, a brief, a short lecture, uh, because between the foot and mouth disease uh, part that doesn't really, uh, well, I mean, where there are very few models that don't consider farms, so spatial aspects. And this avian influenza that also needs to consider spatial aspects. I just give you sort of a general gist of uh, the type of models that you can see uh, in this context, and we'll see much more work in the um, spatial aspects. So the next model is a model of Liu, uh, Duvuri, and Jianhong Wu. So these are uh, people that are, um, well, I mean, at some point, some of them were based at York. Uh, Wu is still in York. Um, and here, this is a model of H5N1. We'll see this model again in the spatial part because it has spatial aspects, but I'll present the model here and then we'll come back to it in, uh, in the next lecture. So uh, the model considers three types of bird and the environment, because when you saw uh, when I was talking of where the virus can be, the virus can remain in uh, locations. And so here they consider birds, but also the environment. So they have poultry. Uh, so these are the uh, livestock birds. They have wild birds, and those wild birds, uh, some of them die after the infection, and others survive the infection. And finally, they look at the density of virus in the environment. And so the flow diagram looks something like this. So these are the poultry animals the wild animals who die of the virus, and you can see this arrow coming out here, which is uh, death due to the virus. The poultry also can die from uh, the virus. And finally, there's the wild animals, but that survive in the environment. V, remember, is the uh, density of virus in the environment, and V comes into the propagation through these arrows here, uh, beta C, beta W, and beta D, which correspond to infection of animals through their contact with a contaminated environment. Whereas these infection terms here look at the infection of animals through their interactions with other animals. Okay. So, as I said, we'll come back to that. Uh, another uh, model that I thought I would mention uh, is one by Xinlin Ma and Wendy Wang. Um, and it's a discrete time model. So I thought I would show something a little different. Uh, and it also includes seasonal uh, components. So what they do here is that they look at uh, the year and they divide the year into periods. They have a what they call a reproductive period, uh, during which their poultry can reproduce. And then they have an overwintering period, uh, where, uh, so the index would be W, where uh, the poultry does not reproduce and potentially there is emergence of avian influenza. And that overwintering period is divided into an infection phase and a disease control phase. Uh, the assumption is that individuals infected with avian influenza do not recover. So one word about this uh, subdivision. So this um, 
when you're looking at discrete time models, so we saw a discrete time model for foot and mouth disease the other day, um, but uh, when you're looking at a discrete time model, it's important to get the timing right. Okay, and so that's why they are very specific here in terms of, okay, they first this, this divide the year into two periods, and then they also divide this period into two phases. And when you're writing a discrete time model, this is something important to keep in mind. Okay, so th these are the model equations. It's a different, uh, completely different setup from the one we saw in foot and mouth disease, but you can see, so the susceptible and infected uh, P, that's the uh, reproducing stages. This is the number of susceptible and infectious animals altogether, and th these are the ones in the uh, overwintering period when they're not active. Okay, so you have a system that is uh, not too complicated, uh, but from a mathematical point of view, this is uh, not something easy to study. Uh, I'll point out, so phi is the transmission function and they assume a bunch of hypotheses on phi. And I'll, again, this is not really the object of this course, so I'm not going to detail the mathematics. I'll just point out what type of thing they are doing. Uh, they uh, characterize what they call an R star and then an R zero, a reproduction number. And what they obtain are things like so. If that R star is larger than one and the R zero is less than one, then the disease-free equilibrium is globally stable. Whereas if it's R zero is greater than one, the disease-free uh, equilibrium is unstable and the system is uniformly persistent. Uh, we saw that the other day already. That means solutions never go extinct. Uh, and furthermore, that model is quite complicated in terms of its dynamics. There are flip bifurcations, hop bifurcations, and so on, uh, but these are characterized using uh, another reproduction number. Okay, uh, <clears throat> this here is a paper that I did not know, which I find extremely interesting. Uh, but it's a very different modeling uh, method as well. And I feel like this, uh, this course is also about opening up to different techniques. So this is a, this is a model of high path uh, avian influenza. But they're looking out at outbreaks uh, in the commercial uh, poultry industry. But uh, the, the important thing here is they're looking at the, the actual outbreaks. So, uh, and again, in terms of opening up to other modeling techniques, this is a branching process model. I haven't showed you any branching process this far. This is a stochastic type of uh, simulation, uh, well, simulation and model. Uh, and it allows to consider uh, different properties and it's very adapted to uh, characterizing outbreaks. So let me uh, briefly summarize what they are doing here. They define a random variable X, which is the number of newly infected birds in a generation. Okay. And essentially they write their model using generations that are the average time between successive generations in the in infectious infection process. Okay, so this is important. I mean, if you followed a little bit uh, the COVID uh, sort of the activity around COVID modeling, at the beginning of the outbreak, uh, there was a lot of um, focus on trying to find the generation time or the generation interval. They've got several different names that don't correspond exactly to the same thing. But here, this is a model that looks at um, a branching process. So a branching process describes uh, something which branches. Okay, so uh, a new case is generated, uh, uh, a new individual is born, etc., or dead, uh, or dies. Okay, so this is a branching process, and the, the time step for that branching process is the generation time. 
they uh, look at a Poisson uh, generated uh, process and again I'm not going to go into the details this is an entirely different uh, uh, modeling mechanism than ODEs um, so the, but they're related except that this is stochastic okay uh, so the transmission rate is taken to be this uh, the sum of these two numbers and these numbers are uh, as follows uh, PBL is the local contact probability between birds on a local level. Okay, so they, they look at two aspects. They look at little groups of birds that are congregating together. And they also look at the more general farm level uh, interaction. Okay, so you have social groups of birds um, of, a, uh, of a certain size, L, and then they have larger groups of birds uh, that interact less because the, the group is larger and so here that probability here PBG is smaller than uh, PBL. So when you're analyzing um, <coughs> branching processes uh, you end up writing typically what's called a probability generating function. So a probability generating function for newly infected birds is simply this. I think I might be missing. This is minus. I could be missing the minus. Uh, no, actually. So this is the probability generating function for the number of newly infected birds and the probability of extinction, uh, which is used in. Uh, branching processes is uh, actually the smallest root of this fixed point equation here q equals phi x of q and so they find the smallest root of this in uh, 0 1 and that gives you a probability of extinction the reproduction number is denoted r star and it's simply this uh, sum of this quantity here so the, pro the rate of the process uh, I'm not going to go over the details at all. They, they then go through a variety of extensions of that simple model. They derive a model for an infection within a cage. Uh, they derive models for emergence of high path uh, avian influenza from low path uh, avian influenza. And they look at structures that mimic commercial poultry uh, installations. Okay, so they have barn and free range, uh, for instance, they have caged, uh, barn and free range, etc. And then they further look at low path uh, introductions in, for example, the free range animals by an animal coming from outside. Uh, it's a very thorough analysis, very interesting. Uh, they have uh, looked uh, also at the type of configurations. This is done for Australia. Uh, so they have looked at the type of configurations that the farms have. So these uh, numbers here are essentially, so this is a uh, meat, a uh, free range meat. Um, you have here meat, uh, barn meat, uh, free range meat, barn layer. These are the different configuration of farms and they use that to parameterize the model. Uh, you can see, so range access, they have a cycle length. So this is for how many uh, days. So this is, for example, in uh, battery uh, chicken uh, production. So their chickens are kept on average for 49 days, whereas uh, free range, um, well, depending on the context, it could be longer, etc. So there's a cleaning time. There's a variety of uh, factors that come into this. And what they obtain are um, graphics like this, for instance, where they have an expected transmission rate of the disease, an introduction rate. And as a, as a consequence of this introduction rate, so this is the rate at which uh, LPAI cases, for instance, are introduced into uh, one such setting and what you have this is c so this is the uh, hpai outbreak with mutation per uh, 
uh, transmission. And so this is the probability of an uh, HPI, high path, um, high path avian influenza outbreak, given that there is an introduction of a low path in uh, such a context. Okay, so this is, um, a, we recommend taking a look at this paper, although the mechanisms of uh, modeling are different from the ones that you have seen in the majority of this course, uh, this is worth taking a look at because it's really quite a, <coughs> a, 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 a it gives you a good understanding of this probability that uh, an outbreak will occur, which, which is where everything stops, essentially. Uh, the next uh, model that I want to look at is a model uh, by Tiensin et al. Uh, this is um, uh, in Thailand. <coughs> it's looking at H5N1 uh, in Thailand be during an epidemic that took place there in 2004. The reason I wanted to show this one is that what they are using is a very simple SIR model. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that sometimes a, a simple model also uh, can be extremely useful. Um, so here they're using this type of model, they're looking at uh, this outbreak, uh, but they're looking at a different variety of uh, contexts here. So we have uh, backyard, uh, um, animals, they have broiler fact fighting animals, uh, and so they have a different, they have good data here, and they're trying to use that data uh, with this very simple model. And from the, using that very simple model, what they uh, obtain is transmission rates, uh, reproduction number of the different types of animals, okay? so. Uh, flock type, you can see, so uh, all of them are laying hens, uh, backyard, uh, so this is more like artisanal, this is more production, and this is all of them, and depending on how long they assume that the infectious period is, they have different estimates for the value of, uh, this is R0, okay, uh, well, this is this is the transmission parameter, this is R0. So you can see that uh, the transmission parameter changes quite a lot depending on what you assume the infectious period to be, but the R0 itself, well, it does change, uh, especially in some contexts, it changes quite a lot, but not as much, of course, as big. Uh, one, uh, I think it's the last one that I wanted to look at. Uh, this is also a relatively recent model. Uh, this is a model for co-circulation of low path and high path um, uh, strains of avian influenza. Uh, so this is uh, Nick Bash et al. So their assumptions are, um, well, they characterize the biology of the different uh, strains. So there's a LPAI prevalence, um, there's a trans what type of a, 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 a assumptions they're making about transmissions. Um, <clears throat> also, I won't go into the detail, there's a, there's a long uh, list of biological assumptions that describe how high path and low path in, in avian influenza interact, um, and the uh, model looks something like this. So this is a typical uh, multi-strain model. So you can see that there's different um, different strains here that corresponds to low path, high path, etc. And individuals are susceptible to one of them, and they, depending on how things uh, evolve. And uh, one thing you should see here, uh, the, these are the A, E3, the, the ones with an index 3 are the ones that evolve from the other ones. I believe it's because of dual infection. Um, 
And that's it uh, for this. Uh, so you might have noticed that I'm a little... Um, I, I, I might re-record these videos uh, at a later date. Uh, I have a cold. Uh, well, I'm assuming it's a cold. Uh, so I'm a little uh, fuzzy. Uh, today, I apologize. I will uh, record the videos on the, the, the video about uh, the spatial spread, which I think is a very important one. I won't record it today. I apologize. Uh, I was planning on recording it today, but I don't think this is going to be a longer, much longer video. And I much prefer to do it uh, when my cold has subsided a little bit because right now I'm a little slow. <laughs> 